I have, uh, I've been here since 2012, and I have a, a bit of a history with uh, writing letters, so inflicting them upon people and having them inflicted upon me and uh, requesting them myself. In fact, I've even requested uh, now in my 10th year as a, as a professor, I still need letters. Like this is something that you kind of never escape. <laughs> Uh, you still need references, you still need people to speak to your, uh, your quality as a, as a scholar or a, uh, or, a, uh, or a worker. So as a letter writer, I've written letters for 83 students that have been in my lab. So that's undergrads, uh, high school students, grad students, and postdocs. I've written for uh, 99 students outside of my lab. And, uh, and each one of these takes about maybe an average of like five letters. So it's almost like a thousand letters that I've submitted over this time. And um, just because uh, Ruben wanted me to tell you that I've been like successful here, just to give you an idea, like we have, my group has sent 11 students to Stanford, for example, just to take one example of a, of a, of a of a school for grad school or postdoc. Okay, as a reader of letters, um, I have I review for three different graduate degree programs: um, nanoengineering, chemical engineering, and material science. And also, I have reviewed for the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program twice. I review for TRELS um, every year, almost every quarter. And so, I would estimate that I have. Uh, that I have perused more than 2,000 letters in my, uh, in my career so far. And as a requester of letters, I had to get letters for undergrad, grad school, postdoc, which is like an academic residency that professors do before, between their grad student years and when they become a, uh, a professor. So I got letters for that. I had to get letters for scholarships, uh, fellowships, uh, grants even, so sometimes a faculty member needs to ask a more senior faculty member for a letter to even get a grant or like an, uh, an award. So uh, they're <laughs> like, they're, it's still, there's even in science and engineering, there's still kind of like this academic beauty pageant where you still like, you still need to get like awards to add to your CVs, um, which are your like a CV is, uh, is like a long version of a resume that has all your publications on it. All right, so what is a letter of recommendation? A letter of recommendation is a third party, non-quantitative assessment of the candidate because they already have your transcripts and your test scores and everything. It is a description of the strengths and weaknesses, um, possibly, of a candidate. It offers a personal perspective on the candidate from your recommender, and it is regarded as the least curated part of the application because the applicant probably didn't write what's in the letter or at least didn't sign off on the final version of what gets submitted. And I will tell you what I mean by that. It is curated in the sense that as a as an applicant, you get to decide who you want to write the letter. So you're not going to pick somebody who you know doesn't like you. Right? So there is some curation involved. You want to have good letters because a weak letter can weaken a strong academic letter. But at the same time, a strong letter can overcome a perceived deficiency elsewhere in the application. So if you have a couple of, of um, C minuses or a D on your transcript and you want to make up for it, um, maybe you worked with a, with a professor or somebody in, uh, at an internship or, uh, or in a jo campus job, and they can speak your praises enough to overcome these perceived deficiencies. So when do you need a letter? And I went over a little bit of this in the uh, couple slides ago. So if you're applying for certain types of scholarships, 
life on campus. We have McNair, um, the uh, Initiative for Maximizing Student Development, which is an NIH, National in Institutes of Health affiliated program, and other uh, TRIO programs, although there are no longer three, I think there are eight TRIO programs. Um, internships, summer research opportunities, um, jobs, although often providing the contact information of a reference is enough in those cases, and you don't need to have the letter sent ahead of time. Sometimes we'll just call the reference. For grad schools, you definitely will need letters. Um, postdocs, sometimes if you are applying to a position after grad school, you might need a letter. And then this is where, <laughs> like, um, sort of, this is not something you have to be concerned about now, but for some students uh, to um, uh, need to get a visa, oftentimes their immigration lawyer writes the letter for a scholar in a particular field to submit on the student's behalf that needs a visa. Professorship, so when I got this job, I needed to have three letters submitted on my behalf. Grants, so there is a, uh, a there are often grants like the National Science Foundation. So you've seen that this TV show or whatever, usually on PBS, had funding from the National Science Foundation with the big wheel uh, logo. And there are often letters of support that are required for those grants. Oftentimes, it's a boilerplate letter like, if this person gets the money, I promise to do whatever work they said I would do. And literally, it's that, it can only be that specific. They only allow certain language. But other types of NSF grants and from under other funding agencies require a almost like a character reference of the professor submitting the grant. Same thing for, uh, for awards. And then once your career gets much farther advanced than I am, you even need letters for things like National Academy member memberships. So when you see that the Jacobs School of Engineering has X number of National Academy of Engineering members, all of those people needed letters, even though they needed them when they were 65 years old. So what goes in a letter? When I'm writing a letter, I want to describe my own position and the experience that I have evaluating candidates like you. So you are often, as a letter writer, asked specifically to say, like, how do you know the applicant? How long have you known them? How long have you evaluated candidates in that same cohort, like senior undergraduates or sophomore undergraduates? And approximately how many people in that group have you had the opportunity to observe? And this is very fresh in my head now because now is grad application season. So I'm submitting a lot, a lot, a lot of these letters. And, uh, and the numbers that go into those box boxes, I've been evaluating students for 10 years. Um, I've had the opportunity to observe um, maybe 3,000 students if you take all the classes that I've taught and all the interactions that I've, uh, that I've, that I've had. Um, uh, how long they've known you and, and in what capacity. So the recommender needs to be able to make a strong statement like I've known I've known you, I've known the student, I've known the applicant for three years as an instructor in two courses. One of them was maybe a graduate course that the student um, excelled in and did as well as the graduate students. Um, you, the recommender will want to say how you met the applicant. So is that in office hours? Is that because the student made a lot of uh, great comments or questions or ask great questions during class. Maybe the final presentation or final project was really, really well done. This is uh, for, rec for references for professors or your other letter writers that know you really well you may be comfortable with like telling them some of your personal background and how you became interested in engineering, how you became interested in research, um, what personal uh, obstacles maybe you've overcome to be in, that, in the position to apply for whatever opportunity you're applying for. 
Um, this doesn't need to go in the letter, but it does show that it does show the reader, the recipient of the letter, that the recommender really did know the candidate, really did know you. So the organization that you apply to will already have your transcript and your test scores as appropriate, uh, but they won't have any commentary on it. They won't be able to put it in context without the letters unless they have a personal experience with that particular school. So the writer might say, this GPA of 3.x ends up being in approximately the top 10% of the graduating class. But they might also say, if you take the GPA and the personal uh, and the research experience and the personal qualities of hard work, curiosity, then this person is in the top 1%, even if the GPA is not. So they can make a holistic assessment of where somebody ranks as a, as a complete candidate. You want your recommender to be able to comment on your curiosity. So you want to be known to your, the organization that you're applying to that you are a curious person. And this is the same in industry as it is in academia. They always want to know, is this person a curious person? Do they, uh, do they, uh, and do they work hard? In the letter, the writer might also comment on any blemishes that are perceived to be in, uh, in a transcript. Those could be grades of D, F, W, which whenever I see that, I think of the Dallas-Fort Worth airport for whatever it's worth. Um, whether you had time off, like a break in your transcript, because sometimes that could, uh, doesn't necessarily raise a red flag, but it raises a question. Um, and also if there is an example of misconduct on your record. So on the transcript, um, if you had an unfortunate um, sort of run in with the with academic misconduct and uh, and you've gone through the proper uh, the you, you've you've um, recognized your mistake and you went through the the proper uh, procedures, you retook the class, you got a passing grade in it with no misconduct, you want your recommender to be able to, uh, to help you explain that. There is no blemish that is not able to be overcome. There's no blemish. Um, any place that's worth working at will be able to, uh, any place that you want to be as a member, um, will have the value of forgiveness anyway. Um, I have a, uh, a former PhD student who um, after partway through his freshman year at, uh, as an undergrad, he became addicted to uh, methamphetamine and heroin and was uh, living on the street uh, for five years. He was in and out of jail uh, during that time. Um, he repented, he got clean, and he got back into, uh, into his undergraduate program. And now he has a mountain of patents working for a multinational uh, engineering company that everyone has, has heard of and has won the top awards there. So there are no blemishes that are unsurmountable. Um, and the letter and somebody who knows you, somebody who can go to bat for you, is the, uh, is, can, can really help you overcome those. Uh, work history and evidence of teamwork. So you can put that I've been a member of a team in your personal statement, but if somebody, if a third party has observed you being a good teammate, being a, uh, a, a, an, an understanding and open team member in a, uh, in a group project, for example, then that is a, a huge benefit in your, uh, in your application. So the audience for the letter might also want to know or will also want to know your research and work experience or, your, or evidence for commitment to research or work experience. So if you're applying to a research position for the first time, obviously you don't have the research experience yet, but you certainly will have evidence for commitment. 
to the research experience. Okay, whom should you ask for a letter? So for most, um, most things as an undergraduate, you'll need one to two letters. If you end up applying to the NSF GRFP, you'll probably need three letters. If you want to apply to grad school, you'll need three letters. Uh, prepare ahead of time by establishing relationships. And how do you do that? You go to office hours, you go to talks like these, you go to seminars, um, you meet your, your, uh, your TAs. Um, you should ask the people who know you best. You should ask yourself the question, who among these candidates, say I need two letters and I have five people who could possibly write them, who is going to be able to write the most descriptive and to a zeroth order approximation, by descriptive I mean long, <laughs> who is going to take up space with detail, not with fluff? Who knows you well enough to provide that kind of detail? And there's something you need to, you may want to consider, and that's balancing the prestige of the writer. So a professor versus a postdoc versus a graduate student alongside how well they know you. So if one axis is prestige, the other axis is how well they know you. Of course, you don't want your best friend your roommate, um, or <laughs> to, well, okay, bad example. You don't you don't want somebody else's roommate down the hall who doesn't know you at all uh, to to write you a letter, right? But if you had a Nobel Prize winner uh, write you a letter and they didn't know you at all, that would be kind of worthless too. Um, well, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> The fact that they would answer your email, I guess, is, is pretty pretty significant. Um, but everyone kind of kind of sees what I what I mean here. Like if you have one faculty member, two faculty members, where you've really you really know them from office hours, you've really engaged with their topic, you've asked them thoughtful questions, um, then that's those relationships are gold in this uh, in this activity. So not every writer can be in the favorable quadrant. If you need three letters, you only have one person that is in that like top, top quadrant, that's okay. The other two can just kind of be, yeah, this person was a good student, they got an A in my class, um, or they got a B in my class, but they were really curious, they showed up at office hours. That's, that's great, that's fine. It's okay to ask postdocs and student and grad students, but usually these letters, especially for when you're applying to grad school, are like less, less heavy they, they, um, because uh, they don't, really because they don't have as much experience um, uh, evaluating candidates like you. Uh, probably if you ask a postdoc, they might never have written a letter of recommendation for somebody. So you can ask your employers, but for university positions, so positions that involve academic style research, make sure at least one faculty member writes a letter too, just because they know what kind of uh, activities they'll be doing in the lab. So there are some points of courtesy. So give your writers at least two weeks notice. When you apply for multiple items, uh, say um, multiple fellowships, try, this is not always possible, but if possible, try to make the emails arrive in your recommender's inbox at approximately the same time, or at least the same day. And that just makes it way easier on the part of the recommender so that they don't lose one of the emails. Um, you know, ultimately they are responsible for it, but you want to make their job as easy as possible. And when somebody's writing, uh, sometimes 200 letters a year, submitting 200 letters a year, like I have done in previous years. It, um, not for 200 different people, but sometimes during grad school season, uh, there, might be, uh, there, there might be 20 people that need 10 letters each. So in filling out the details, include everything, including the phone number, address, institution, and title of the writer. So there's nothing that's more of a bummer, and I know, poor, poor tenured professor, but when I have to type my phone number like a hundred times in an afternoon, 
it makes me, makes me crazy. All right, so sometimes I get an email that's like an Excel sheet of the table of schools and deadlines. Um, I basically never open that file. Um, and I know it took some time to create, it's just not helpful to me, like because I don't manually transfer them to my calendar. If you insist that they be in my calendar, you can use a Google um, Calendar invite and I'll get it that way. Um, but usually if I get all the emails as a chunk, I'll just do them one after the other. If there's only one thing, then it's fine. It's no, it's no problem. But if you're applying to multiple fellowships, it does really help to chunk them. If you can't do it because of different deadlines, not a big deal, just, just helps. Don't feel obligated to get a gift for your writers. Um, it's always uh, very much appreciated, but I always feel like um, it, was, it was my job to do this. I was happy to do it. And a true gift would be when you are in a position to evaluate people with less experience, um, uh, your junior colleagues, um, that you just pay it forward. And that's the, uh, that's the that's the best gift, but um, <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, there are some fellowships I will not write for. Um, and there's one graduate fellowship from the Hertz Foundation that I have my letter all like set up to go. And then I open the Hertz application thing and for the recommender. And there are like eight different fields that require Five, that have a max limit of 5,000 words each, and my letter is 1,000 words. <laughs> and I feel like if I don't just write and write and write, then I'm only gonna max, like, I'm only gonna fill up like 10% of the allowable characters in this, in this form. And I know that there are some people, some recommenders that are actually gonna do it and take two days straight to write this one, this one extra letter of recommendation. And since there are so few of that particular fellowship awarded, when I, get, when I get people asking me for it, I tell them, no, I won't do it. But I'll do, any, I'll do anything else, um, like, uh, like meatloaf. I'll do anything for a letter, but I won't do Hertz. All right, so here's an example of a tier one letter. And uh, so I have, kind of three tiers of service. There's like copper, gold, and platinum. <laughs> and, uh, and this is a tier one uh, letter. And it's really just a description of how I got to know this person and what they did when they were a member of, uh, of my group. Um, this person ended up where they wanted to go. They got into their top choice uh, school. Um, it's it they it this this letter did its job and i felt like the extent that i knew the candidate this was the best i could do in terms of if i put anything else in there it would have been disingenuous this is an example of a tier two letter this person ended up getting into a top five um, engineering PhD program. Um, there is a lot more personal detail in terms of obstacles um, overcome, um, what they did as a member of my lab. So specifically the types of experiments that they, uh, that they did. And um, uh, how I know them. Um, some of the other work experience that they told me about. So sometimes I will interview a student. When they ask me for a letter, I'll sit down with my laptop, they'll come in and I will say, tell me about yourself and I'll take dictation basically. And I will convert that dictation into the letter. I don't do that for every student and it really does depend in large part on timeline like how much time is there to actually schedule a meeting like that, but I, but I do it quite, uh, quite often. This is a tier three letter. This is platinum service. Just kidding. This person deserved every single, every single thing I said about them. Um, this person also got into a, uh, also got into a top five engineering PhD program. 
and really i'm not i'm not saying i'm not using like a ton of uh a ton of superlatives beyond the first paragraph and the last paragraph it's really like there were they did a lot they did a lot in the group like they were in the group for a really long time they uh they learned a lot of different techniques they were a leader in the group um there was this uh this book chapter in like the leading uh, handbook of my field that they were the first author of and it uh and and it just i had so much to say i just let the facts speak for themselves this is probably the strongest letter for a grad school applicant that i had uh, that i had written All right, so um, we'll take a waypoint here and cover some, some FAQs. So do I automatically repurpose a previous letter? So when I get a, uh, when I get a, a fresh request from a student, do I use the letter that I submitted last year? I will substantially revise it. Um, usually because I've gotten to know that student a little bit more, they have more on their resume. So don't worry, I won't submit the same letter. It will definitely be, uh, be revised. I, so the question is, do students or researchers need to hit a certain criteria in GPA, number of lab hours worked, et cetera, in order for me to write a letter? No. Um, I accept 98%, maybe it's 97.856, uh, of recommendation requests that I receive um, because I know like what a, what a pain and how like difficult it is to gather up the courage to like ask a professor to evaluate your, your transcript and your work history. Um, and because you often need more than one letter and for grad school, you need, you need at least three, but I don't spend the same amount of time on somebody's letter who I just had in a class and who never spoke up, but they, they passed the class and I can say that I can ask them to provide details. I'll show like what mechanism I use for the student to provide details in a moment. So no, no certain criteria. How should a student ask or what th should they say if they're requesting via email? And this can be really simple. Just uh, remind me, if, it, if you're not somebody that I know, remind me of how, how, uh, how we've interacted in the past, that you need a letter for this. Hopefully the deadline is more than two weeks away. Um, and uh, some professors might say four weeks. I think two weeks is, is fine unless I'm like on a long trip or something. What if the student is asking in person? So oftentimes a student will uh, request a meeting with me and um, toward the end of the meeting, it's, it's the, the rhythm of this type of meeting is often very similar. So we talk about uh, my research, their coursework, and then uh, toward the end and their, their interests. And toward the end, they say, I'm applying for such and such, would you help me? And the answer is essentially always yes. Um, so, uh, so yeah, really try to convey your sense of interest in the topic, interest in the, the area in which you are, uh, you are applying. It's, uh, you can ask during office hours, um, try to do it when no other students are there because the office hour is really for the academic content unless nobody else is there, then you can ask whatever you want. Um, you can use coffee with a prof or you can just ask to go to coffee with the prof. Um, I think coffee with the prof is, does not exist this year because of COVID, but I think in the next quarter or two, it should uh, be, be back up. Okay, so what if the student hasn't seen or spoken with the potential recommender in a while? That's okay. Um, I, if, if the, actually, I got, a, I got several requests this year from students that I had in like 2017, 2018, and I was happy to write their, uh, their letter too. What goes through your mind when I receive a request for a letter of recommendation? I, 
Oftentimes, I, if I don't know the person right off the bat, I will use my Sith powers and look up their photo and then say, ah, yes. <laughs> um, I will check my old course records and see how they did in my course. If I have any like assignments that are saved digitally, I'll go back and take a look. Um, my answer is yes, 97.986% of the time anyway, but I do want to know, I do, I do really want to make it like a, uh, a personal interaction. So I will comment on some aspect of, the, uh, of, of our interaction when I respond to, uh, to emails like that. Should students offer to write a draft? If so, how should they frame it? Usually the student does not have to offer to write a draft. Usually the professor will ask for help. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is what I would say when a, when a professor asks to draft the letter for them. This is not a sign of laziness on the part of the professor, although it might be. <laughs> um, if the professor asks you for enough help that where you will be writing a first draft, it's because you wouldn't want the letter that they would write you because they don't know you well enough to write the letter. So you can use the letter as a as a vehicle to develop your relationship with this professor. And that's fine because life is short and we all have stuff to do, right? So, um, so it's possible, um, it's possible to do this. Some tactics are to leave out superlatives. So don't say like, this is a stupendously awesome student that I'm recommending. Focus on the facts, let the, uh, let the recommender add in the superlatives, although I tend to like to stick with the facts anyway, like even if I'm writing something for like a student that was in my lab for four years and has a uh, cell paper or something, picking a journal that I've never published in. All right, any prose that you write, write it in the third person. So. Darren Lapomi did such and such. If I'm writing it, I'm, I'm the student that's asking for the letter. Uh, the reason is um, because you don't want the professor who's busy to leave in any instances of I. Because that will, <laughs> that is clear <laughs> that the professor did not write the letter. If two recommenders ask you for help, do not give both of them the same set of bullet points. So you need two letters. They both say, I'm, I'd love to write the letter. I'm really busy. Can you give me some facts that you want to make sure I include? Or you want to draft, can you write the first draft in the third person? One time I was recommending a, <laughs> or <laughs> weird circumstances involving letters of recommendation. One time, my wife was applying for business school at UCSD, and she was at Stanford doing a postdoc, and this, and her postdoc advisor at Stanford said, can you write the letter for me? And then my wife asked me, Darren, you've written a lot of letters for a lot of people, can you write a letter for me to give to my recommender? <laughs> and I did it. And, uh, um, and she got like a, a scholarship. So I was pretty good there. Um, <laughs> so there was another circumstance where I had a graduate student who was applying to a postdoc. And this is a prestigious postdoc at MIT. And the Two uh, of his, so he needed three letters for this postdoc, and two of the recommenders, so I wrote my letter, and then two of the recommenders asked for him to draft it. 
and then he asked me for help. I ended up writing all three letters. <laughs> and I freaked out because I noticed that the first line of two of them were almost the same. <laughs> like, thank you for the opportunity to recommend so-and-so for such and such. It isn't as awful as it seems, <laughs> like, because the person who's submitting the letter would not put their signature on something in this community that they didn't agree with. And it's because the, the reputational damage, so academia is a small world, and the reputation, and industry is a small world in certain, in, in the areas where you will be working. And it is, it would be a simple matter to get like an awful reputation as somebody who recommended bad candidates. And that's not something that anyone wants. And so it is pretty likely that the person who signs their name on the letter will take out a lot of stuff or, or, or maybe uh, augment certain areas. Uh, and ultimately, they have to be comfortable with what they're, what they're signing their name to. I rarely use exactly what's given to me. I've never, I, in fact, most, most of the time, um, depending on the person and the experience of the writer, I usually rewrite, a little Gollum uh, grammar there, I usually rewrite 90% of the prose, but I want to make sure that it's all there. So the prose I might change because it doesn't sound like I wrote it, but the facts, the facts stay, and the facts are what the, uh, are what the committee will be interested in. Some professors will not, will not write a letter if they don't know you, even if you were like in a class and got an A plus, they won't know, they won't write the letter. Some will accept the invitation, but give you the caveat that they are going to write, so-and-so took my class and got a B, best professor so-and-so. And that's all that they'll write. And they'll tell you ahead of time that that's what they're gonna do if they don't know you. This is my template. I literally give this out. To whom it may concern, I'm happy to re recommend blank for blank. My name is Darren Lapome, a professor of nanoengineering and chemical engineering in the Department of Nanoengineering at UC San Diego. The rest of this paragraph is like an abstract. Please add how I've known you and in what capacity. Please add facts under the prompts below. I will tie them together into a coherent narrative once I have these items. Try not to use superlatives, comparisons, etc. I will do this to the extent appropriate. So under here, personal history that I would conceivably know <laughs> um, from my perspective. Academic history, performance, relevant research and internship and work history, a summary statement, and then thanks for your kind consideration of so-and-so's application. All right, that is my presentation on letters of recommendation. I'm happy to take any questions.